Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. And if you're just learning about this show now, I want you to know that this show is on the air for you. It's for you, the listener, because we are going to do everything we can to bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain. Our goal for each show is to bring on answers and options to making your lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And remember, if you can't listen live, go to our website at answers.network and browse through a variety of heartfelt and enlightening topics. I am confident you will find something that will bring greater joy to your life or to someone you love. I also want to ask a favor of you. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. This is just one powerful way that we can make a positive influence in the world. And speaking of making a positive influence, that can certainly be said about today's guest. Now, our topic today, it could be space travel, or it could be philanthropy, or it could be how to outmaneuver the system of political patronage and bureaucracy that threatened the space agency and the future of human spaceflight. Our guest book, Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Age, offers a blueprint for how to drive production and meaningful government change. And there you have our topic. Joining us is Lori Garver, who led the NASA transition team for President-elect Obama and served as Deputy Administrator for NASA from 2009 to 2013. Lori is a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She's an executive in residence at Bessemer Venture Partners and a member of the Board of Directors for Hydrosat. Lori founded EarthRise Alliance, a philanthropic organization utilizing satellite data to address climate change. Her previous positions include Associate Administrator for Policy at NASA and Executive Director of the National Space Society. Lori was the recipient of the 2021 Public Service Award for AIAA and the 2020 Lifetime Achievement Award for Women in Aerospace and has been awarded three NASA Distinguished Service Medals. Lori, welcome to Answers Network. Uh, Thank you for having me, Alan. Well, it is my pleasure. And and as we were saying uh, uh, just before we came on the air, uh, I was someone who was very, very interested in uh, space. And that waned for a little bit, but uh, the interest is back. And I'm glad to know that you and your team has a lot to do with that. Now, before before we talk about the book, though, share with us a little bit about your journey that led you to work at NASA. Yes, one of the reasons for writing the book, in fact, is that I did not have the typical journey to work at NASA, especially in the roles I ended up serving. I was raised in Michigan, a small um, very typical upbringing, although my, I, I had no engineers or scientists um, in my family. My grandfather and uncle served in the state legislature and state senate. And so I did grow up in a time when public service was seen as much more positive than it often is now. And that was an aspiration. I was um, quite interested in and capable in science and math, but as uh, a female growing up in um, the 1960s and 70s was not encouraged, in some cases actively discouraged from pursuing those fields. I talk a bit about that in the book. So when I went to college, I went to Colorado College. um, I was a political science and economics major. Moving to Washington, D.C. right after school, I wasn't looking at a space career. In fact, I I had not grown up overly interested in space. I think likely a lot of that was due to um, not seeing anyone who looked like me involved. Um, Sally Ride, the first American uh, woman who flew Mm -hmm. to space, was in 1983, the year I graduated from college. But I worked for John Glenn in my first job. 
out of college in Washington, D.C., and it was on his political presidential campaign. And although that was not successful, and I had been raised a Republican in Michigan, that's what my grandfather and uncle's party, but um, typical sort of college uh, evolved into being much more socially um, liberal. And I worked for John Glenn on his run for the presidency that was against Ronald Reagan in the 19, uh, in 84 election. He didn't even end up winning the primary, but for me, not only did that relationship help me um, in my space career over the coming decades, but I met a lot of people who worked for NASA and applied for a job at an organization called the National Space Society. I ended up staying there 13 years, from an entry level position to running it. And I got a master's in science, technology, and policy at night. And I started to really get a sense that our vantage of space was unique. And in my generation, similar to being around when we were first, you know, venturing um, across the oceans or the first flights in the atmosphere. And being a part of that was something I found very exciting. And the kinds of things we were able to do from space were unique and helpful to society and our economy. And I um, was thrilled to be involved. And I got to know the head of NASA, both during my master's program, as well as executive director of the National Space Society. He asked me to serve on his NASA advisory council, which was a volunteer position. And I, I'm sure I was the youngest person at the mm -hmm. time and, and maybe the you know, first woman, I don't know. And um, a couple years later, he asked me to come work for him directly at NASA. So here I was 35 years old and um, ended up running the policy office at the space agency during that five year time that I was there. And again, with a different background than most, not with mm -hmm. engineering or science, but with uh, a look that said, hey, you know, we have um, our investments in government are to advance some aspect of society and focusing NASA on those areas. And in my world and the head of NASA at that time, Dan Golden, um, was very important in shaping this was to be able to use our NASA funding to advance our objectives, whether they be economic um, or social. I think NASA is a civil agency, so we weren't doing as much in national security, but of course, a lot of the technologies we drove had dual use. Uh, so my entrance into the space business was um, fairly unique. And I think that, you know, both served me well at times, but also caused people to react negatively at times. Well, I, I I love that um, that as you went through that, that you kept going. You know that you you know that doors kept being open for you to be able to get in there to be able to make a difference. And the fact that that's kind of what inspired you to write the book. Um, what inspirations are you hoping that the readers will come away with? Well, as the book relates, you know, NASA not. Uh, dissimilar from other government bureaucracies, had a bit of hardening of the arteries over the years. And a lot of us who grew up uh, in the 60s when the space program was really achieving so much mm -hmm. in such a short yeah. period of time um, had wanted to see those changes. So some of the things I'm sure we'll talk about that um, have happened over the last decade or two helped contribute to, I think, a much more valuable um, program at the space agency. And I think a lot of that can be lessons for other organizations, certainly in government. Uh, procurement was a, a, a very um, uh, un, um, inefficient way to go about getting a lot of what NASA wanted done. But that procurement system is very much part of the overall governmental system that sort of relentless momentum of the status quo so being a part of overcoming that even in 
a small way because there are still lots of programs at NASA that are being run in that way. But those things that have become more effective can be lessons, I think, to other government agencies as well as um, any uh, bureaucratic or organization. I, I think my messages are, and the threads that run through it, that having a different perspective, knowing your end state goal and being willing to stand up to vested interests to achieve uh, positive things is um, hopefully a message that resonates for a lot of people. Well, let's talk a little more about that because again, you and your team have been credited with literally moving mountains at NASA, <laughs> but share some of the, the lessons that you learned in dealing with the status quo and dealing with politicians. Well, the first lessons were, of course, not positive lessons. I was pretty surprised at how hard it was simply to say, we're going to have a competition. You know, in, in America today, you'd think that we would have been um, doing that already. And my time in the 1990s at NASA, Dan Golden, again, the head of NASA at that time, was very much in favor of the private sector competitively um, bidding to be able to replace the services of the space shuttle. We didn't want to own and operate the um, replacement for the shuttle. And when I came back in 2008 as the head of the transition team for the Obama administration, and then asked to be the deputy administrator for the agency, it seemed to me that was obvious. The shuttle was deemed to going to be retired by 2010. Mm -hmm. That decision had been made. But the program that was being developed to replace it was so far off track. And again, largely because it was the government um, owned and operated, putting money out to contractors, what we call cost plus contracting, which does not incentivize um, really productivity. Uh, it incentivizes you continuing for a longer period of time because every year you get that money whether you deliver or not we knew we were going to have to count on the russians to transport our astronauts to and from the space station and of course that seemed to me like of course we would rather have a competition than to do that well what i learned about congress was they weren't very excited at least the handful of members who paid attention to nasa and who were in charge of our budgets were more focused on the immediate contracts and the industry that was in their districts than creating an economic um, right. investment in our future. And so the debate became much more, um, I think, internally based than, than it needed to. So I guess for me, the lessons were that we needed to rise up, and again, a reason to write the book, elevate the discussion. I don't think most people in the public recognize um, what is happening with NASA. They see SpaceX flying astronauts. You have some of my favorite politicians talking about how this is a billionaire, billionaire bailout, when in fact, it's the opposite. We are, the billionaires in many ways are bailing out the taxpayer. In the case of SpaceX, mm -hmm. um, you doing commercial, crew transportation to the space station at NASA's own estimate has saved $20 billion. Um, that's money that NASA can use for um, missions that have more unique um, requirements, which is what NASA is there for. You know, we've been launching people and stuff to space for 50, 60 years. So I think um, what I hope that we can do is follow on these programs with more a, a deeper understanding of how it is best to serve the American people with our tax dollars for our space program. Well, you you just mentioned SpaceX, uh, so let's talk a little bit about Elon Musk because we know that he has some pretty dramatic views in regards to like colonizing Mars. Um, where where does NASA stand on a topic like that, and where do you personally stand on it? Well, that's an just a fascinating topic. The NASA Space Act of 1958 outlines purposes for NASA um, very broadly as you know, utilizing the environment of the atmosphere and beyond to advance technologies, 
to help uh, society, to allow us to mm -hmm. um, leave back businesses that can help our economy. And so we don't take a stand in the NAS in at least any NASA documents that say we're going to, you know, colonize Mars. There have been, of course, science fiction writers opining about this for uh, more than a century. And we definitely recognize, I think, the NASA, um, every, every aspect of the space um, community that long term, it is going to be important for humanity to live beyond the confines of Earth if we want to survive as a species. But that's not really a government mandated program in any way and probably doesn't need to be. We have shorter term interests for the government, but it's a little mixed up because the government is supposed to be there sort of as the safety net driving technologies. And this is one thing that Elon Musk has um, unsettled. And I think there's a lot of reasons that people... Um, have problems with Elon, but his approach to SpaceX is the vision is Mars. And that has been motivating to his team. Mm -hmm. It has allowed them to, for, for just 20 year old company, they were founded in 2002, to be the fifth largest NASA contractor. They are also doing much more for the Air Force. But again, this isn't um, a substitute a, a subsidy. This is them bidding on and winning government work because they are not only bidding less money, they are performing. So we have, I think, a situation now where some of the private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, that is mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos' space company, mm -hmm. have a longer term vision than the government space agency. Um, how they work together over the coming years is going to be, um, you know, chapters yet unwritten. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very interesting because the government is still doing some things in the old way that's costing them a huge amount of money. They're about to maybe start launching those systems at around the same time that maybe SpaceX and Elon are going to be launching a system that the private sector paid for entirely. Um, and how we are going to marry those um, two ideologies will be fascinating. I think that Elon's vision for space exploration is shared by a lot of people, including his employees, um, and that has helped shape SpaceX. Well, um, you you mentioned, I think, either in your book or in one of the uh, other interviews that I checked out, that you feel that he has a huge lead over the other players. Um, what's your, you know, how, what are you basing that on? Oh, um, facts. Uh, Good. <laughs> he Good. he uh, SpaceX has, as I said, fifth largest NASA. Um, contractor at this point but more importantly you know they are transporting astronauts to and from the space station they've done that five times already they've in addition to that had an entirely private mission to space a three-day mission with four new astronauts if you look and that quote in the book is in comparison to blue origin especially bezos's company they are flying suborbital people to and from space. Uh, and it's an entirely different thing. Now they are developing a bigger rocket and I look forward to the day when that is launching. Uh, Boeing is also a company that is on contract to launch astronauts to and from the space station. And I look forward to maybe end of this year, early next year. Um, I think we'll get some more news about that this week um, happening because we do need competitors. But SpaceX has performed and lowered the cost of launching to space. And then now following that up with the Starlink constellation of satellites, I mean, it's, it's just not comparable to either the traditional companies who take years to do the kinds of things SpaceX is doing now in months. Um, remains to be seen. Can they keep this momentum? Uh, their next big vehicle starship uh, has been test flown a few times not always um, successfully but they are trying things 
that the government and other industry mm -hmm. is not doing. They plan to reuse their Starship. And this is sort of a classic comparison. They have been testing this and because they are testing a full reuse, they have to land these vehicles um, vertically. And the other companies complain that they haven't all landed um, in a way that that vehicle could be flown again. Fair enough. But no other vehicle has because they've never even tried. Right. Like we see these fireballs um, because they're trying to land back on Earth. We don't see all the other rockets that have launched to space when they become fireballs because they do it at re-entering Earth's <laughs> orbit. Right. So um, I, I mean, all credit to Blue Origin and to Virgin Galactic, which um, Sir Richard Branson runs, because they also have reusable spacecraft flying people, but they're only going suborbital so far. Okay. And we have a question that is that is coming in uh, while we're on the subject of SpaceX. And again, I want to thank those people that take the time to send in questions. I know some do it ahead of time uh, because they're going to be working during the day. Some send them in right during the show. Now, this one reads, um, my question has to do with the annual budget at NASA. I read that the 2023 proposed budget is $26 billion and that SpaceX total contract with NASA is currently around $3 billion, uh, primarily for the International Space Station. It says, this seems like a great deal of money in a recession and already stressed economy. What are your thoughts? And this is from Brian in New York. Yes, so $26 billion is the request. I think NASA this year's $25 billion and change. And I tend to agree, that is a significant amount of money. And one of the things that bothered me during my now total of 10 years working at NASA is the people at NASA many times have a military background. And so they say, oh, this is just, you know, pocket change at the, compared to the Pentagon. You know, they spend this in a, a week or something. But, you know, first of all, the military in the United States, if I were in that, I'm sure I'd find a lot of waste and be very critical. However, they do have a mission um, that is entirely different than NASA's. Right. Um, another thing NASA people like to do is say, we spend more in this country on pizza or potato chips. Like, okay, that's not the government buying everyone pizza. Um, you really shouldn't be comparing a government agency to how people choose to spend their money. Uh, that said, NASA today has about half the spending power that it did in the mid-1960s at its peak um, for Apollo. I believe that our funding should align with the value of the goals um, and the returns that we at the agency um, are able to provide for the American people. And I know that Apollo and beating the Russians to the moon was just part of what we as a nation felt was our most critical challenge at that time, or at least mm -hmm. a lot of people thought that. Um, and NASA delivered. But what is it today? What are our greatest challenges today? And how does NASA align with those? How is NASA helping us achieve those? We have a program to go back to the moon. I'm not sure everybody really recognizes or would support if they knew what we were spending on that, that particular goal. We say we're going to send the first woman, first person of color. I think that is a, a going to be a wonderful achievement when it happens. I have no doubt that will be inspirational to people. My view is if NASA were um, reducing the costs through um, more efficient and effective programs, the public might be more on board with those long-term goals. NASA's um, connection to most of the 7 billion plus of us on this um, planet is climate change. We, of that 25 billion, spend just over 2 billion addressing earth sciences. And in public opinion polls, um, the most popular activity that NASA does is climate research or sciences. Um, the least popular is sending uh, someone to the moon. So we have our priorities, I think, switched at, at NASA for our spending. All this is fascinating when you take into consideration that the private sector now, um, especially with Bezos and Musk, are interested in 
funding themselves going out and sending people further. In my book, that's great because that's not coming out of the public's tax dollars. And anything that NASA can do to help buy down, um, I think, some of the risk that the private sector will find in achieving those goals um, is a great investment. We should be leveraging our tax dollars and focusing on those things that really deliver value to the American public and to the world. You know, that can be said at so many government <laughs> agencies right now. Uh, but I think most do have a more tangible tie to their customer. And, you know, NASA's customer is the public. That's who pays. Yeah. But I think most people at NASA view the customer to be either the hill or the industry that's actually getting paid to do these things, or even, you know, the scientists um, at the universities who are getting money to do this research. It's, it's a really, there, you don't have analogous agencies. The National Science um, Foundation, NSF, is not even as large as NASA. So you can't say NASA is just a science agency because if it were just science, we wouldn't get that share of the budget. So it's this combination of um, advancing technologies that can help our economy, advancing new knowledge with science, and this sort of feel good geopolitical leadership. All right. Um... This is great. I am just loving this. We're speaking with Lori Garver. Her book is Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Age. And my little uh, thing that I've added to that is, is that how to drive production and meaningful government change. <laughs> so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about space, a lot of things. We're going to take a break right now. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about some of these, uh, the private contractors that you're dealing with, and a little bit more about the information you are getting uh, in regards to climate change, because it seems like that's another issue that I think we really need to be working on. So with that, everybody stay with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to or watching Answers Network. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, West Shield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized school programs and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. We're speaking with Lori Garber, and we are talking about all things NASA, all things space. Uh, so, Lori, let's talk a little bit about, you've mentioned three of the, the, the big billionaire players. Um, talk a little bit about some of the things that are similar and some of the things that are different between uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson. Sure. Interestingly, those companies were founded around the same time, 20 years ago very different cultures. You can imagine, um, so Richard Branson is showy and about the glitz and they're pursuing low, uh, suborbital space tourism. So they're not really taking government money in any significant way. They are hoping to, I think, fly researchers eventually on their suborbital flights. They have pilots. Um, they're the only uh, uh, system right now going to space that, that the pilots actually fly the spacecraft itself. Um, and they flew their founder in the summer of 2020. Um, Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos 
or the quiet company. They, for the first decade, didn't really say much at all. And the first time I met Jeff was in 2010 or 2009, probably. And we mm-hmm. ended up, uh, he gave me a tour of their manufacturing facility in Seattle. I talk about this in the book, as well as my visit down to Texas, where they have their test sites and launch pads. Um, oh, a company where people, I think, also share his vision, which is moving heavy industry off the planet. And he was a follower of Dr. Gerard O'Neill, who is someone I also um, really have an aligned vision with, which is as we do, although this, in my view, multi-generational task, move off the planet in significant and sustainable ways, it is somewhat about being able to preserve our ability to have um, human life sustained here on Earth. Um, SpaceX is... Elon Musk company, it is the um, most productive of the commercial space companies. It has succeeded in lowering the cost of space transportation and winning back market share for the United States for launching commercial satellites. And that has helped our economy tremendously. Our competitors in this, China, France, and Russia, had taken the entire launch market from us um, by around 2000. So winning that back and in 2020 being um, the flag of choice, if you will, for satellite launches um, is a real testament to the work of that company. They often um, overestimate how quickly they can do some of uh, their, their work, but typically get there and it is all done for significantly less cost to the taxpayer than uh, has historically been the case for NASA contractors. Hmm. Yeah, when, when you mentioned that sometimes it takes a little longer, I'm still on the list for the uh, for the Tesla truck. <laughs> ah, yes, maybe that's a, a similar uh, yeah. path. Um, so we, we've got some other questions that have come in. Uh, This one reads, um, so I'm curious about the status of President Trump's Space Force. Was this in the planning for many years behind the scenes? And what is the current status since the Biden administration has taken over? And this is from Naomi in New Mexico. Well, typically I um, give a big proviso that you know, I've, my career has been in civil space, not military space. But this question in particular is is pretty straightforward answer, which is, it actually had been talked about by many people years before President Trump. So this isn't something he he dreamed up. Um, I have, you know, there are a lot of uh, overlaps and conferences where you have both military and civil space. I had been people had hearing conversations about this for years. They found their mark in President Trump and were able to um, get his interest, get that founded. And this is one of those programs that when the Biden administration came in, they did not choose to unravel it. Similarly, the NASA programs have been pretty seamless between the Trump and Biden administrations. There are a few reasons for that, but hopefully at least one significant one is that those were the right we were on a good path. I am one, since I came in with a transition team from the outgoing Bush administration to incoming Obama, and I was exiting NASA at the end of the Clinton administration and incoming Bush, I have been very um, adamant that, at least in my experience at NASA, transition teams keep programs that are healthy and effective. Um, mm-hmm. on sure. schedule, on budget. I'm constantly getting people who say, oh, isn't the problem with the, you know our space program that we have presidents with these different agendas? I don't think that's the case. I think sure. uh, the very best thing anybody in government can do is deliver uh, for what you said you could. I, I give the analogy to parents and our allowance. I have a couple of kids and you know, you're know you a lot more willing to help them out if they're doing what they said they would do. Mm-hmm. Um, now in some of your discussions um, or, or you've, ta- you've 
talked about both in the book and in some of your interviews, your discussions with Jeff Bezos, that you felt like it was just talking to a friend that you've known for years. Tell us about that. Yes, well, of course, people have so many questions because I do know, and in the most questions are about Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk because they have now been the two richest people on the planet. Um, to so comparisons are something that I do in the book, knowing them each a little. I have um, I did meet Elon earlier, and I have positive things to say about him as well, but conversations with him do tend to be more intense and he drives at least again in my case there's not a lot of small talk um drives a discussion has things he wants to know and again i've never worked for any of these people so my relationship might be different than than a lot of them in bezos case i say it's like talking to a friend when he toured me at his Seattle facility. It, he's a very relaxed person. He's talking mm -hmm. to the people on the shop floor and knows them and knows what they're doing. And I can interrupt with a question or um, he'll tell a story and I'll add something and we're both end up laughing. So I, I do think that Jeff and I, uh, we're also close to the same age. Um, maybe, you know, it's a, it's a more natural conversation but it's nothing um you know just just like meeting different people they have different personalities i think these are both geniuses in their own way and i don't agree with all of their policies or ideologies in so many ways but frankly that's the case with my friends and family as well we sure. I, I i really close the book with my main message which is you know we are all in this together and that we all can do more to recognize that we have more in common than differences. And so choosing to appreciate the positives of these couple of individuals who I also, you know, recognize they have some huge um, negatives is something I'm choosing to do. And to me, that outside perspective that we have of our planet from Earth helps us all see that we're in this together. Well, I, I love that as far as the thing about us being in this together. And uh, when you talked about the, the fact that we all have friends that have different ideologies or um, it's true and there's no reason that it should be separating people. I, I used to like being able to debate people, you know, and you could, you know, somebody would have a difference of opinion and you could debate it and and sometimes find yourself going, wow, I didn't realize that. That's that's new information for me. And and you can you can sway people a little bit just by providing more information. And it doesn't seem like you can do that now. Now it's if you disagree, somebody has to label you and then cancel you. And and that and that drives me crazy. Uh, but one of the things I had a very very young person. Uh, in their mid twenties, that was saying something to the extent of, "We're in a situation that cannot be fixed." You know that it's just, you know, and started talking about all the things that were wrong. And I know this is going to sound weird. I had them go on. It was either Amazon Prime or Netflix, and I said, "I want you to watch some episodes of Laugh In." And they said, "What?" I don't understand. Why would that do anything? I said, watch. I said, listen to everything that they are complaining about, but they're doing it through humor. And what you'll find is a lot of it's the same thing. And we got through it just fine. So so let's not have this this view of, oh, my God, it's everything so divisive. We're never going to do it. No, if you've been on this earth long enough and, uh, you know, and you've you've shared a little bit, you know, that we're probably not. Uh, too far apart in that area, um, that I believe that we can, we can bring the pendulum back to somewhere in normalness, to where we're not being as divisive. And we can look at things just as you said, we can look at it as that it's, it's different, but we can still, we can still discuss it, we can still move forward and, and be in it together. Yeah, I'm not sure what the catalyst will be for that. I do think uh, 
obviously my career has been in um, the space arena. And so I think we have a role to play in that, but it's obviously a much bigger issue. And part of it is uh, leadership, which I have mm -hmm. a lot to say about in the book. It is um, yeah. making, making, I think, um, as you said, an understanding that you don't have to agree with everything that someone thinks to respect them and have uh, even healthy, loving relationships. Uh, do you, you remember the movie Independence Day? Sure. Okay. Um, one of the points that I brought up after that was it brought the world together if you were living in that movie. But all of a sudden, people weren't worrying about what was going on there because they were worried about what's going on up here. And maybe if we can do the same thing, but not have it be something that's negative that's happening, you know, that, that we're concerned is happening, but something that's so positive that's happening up there that we can also use that as a way to be less divisive. Yeah, I think for a long time, as I say, for me, space can be transformational in that mm -hmm. way. Of course, those things like finding uh, some sort of non-terrestrial um, intelligent life form would potentially have that. An incoming asteroid is another thing that I a lot of us have thought, well, that would unite the planet. Look at the film, Don't Look Up, however, and even it found a way to have an incoming asteroid be divisive and uh, <laughs> nobody won. Um, yeah. But it, it also, yes, could be more inspirational. Um, and then there's the issue of protecting our own planet and being able to survive here. And as I say in the book, we really live at a time that is unique because we have advanced enough and technologically many of those advances have contributed to the problem, but they have also given us the ability to solve it. And mm -hmm. I think I, I'm not one of those people who just, you know, technology can solve all ills. We need a lot of, right. um, governance and political decision making and leadership as well. But there we do have, in my view, not very long in the big scheme of things um, to turn this around. And so to me, that's job one. Okay. I love it. Um, we have another question that has come in. Uh, this one actually came in um, came in last night. So again, I want to tell those of you if uh, if you go to our website and if you click on um, the, I forget what it is, but anyway, you can just click on it and say that you want to receive our our newsletter. We send it out once a week that just tells people who's going to be coming up on the show and gives you an opportunity to send in questions at that point if you're not going to be able to listen live. Uh, this one came in last night and it reads, uh, I work in a management level position within our state government. I applaud you for making the changes you did at the federal level. Unfortunately, here in California, anyone I've known that has tried to change the status quo has been fired or transferred to a less desirable position. What suggestions do you have for those that see what's wrong with many of our policies but fear the consequences of bringing it uh, to the attention of those uh, in powerful positions? And not surprisingly, this is from Anonymous. Well, that is a tough question, and I know that throughout my career, about a 35-year career so far, um, I have, I, I think, had a healthy questioning of the status quo, trying to find new creative ways um, to get things done that are important. And if you're doing that in a way that is um, can be viewed as positive, you're you're able to get you know a little more leeway when i was in the position as deputy administrator of nasa though you're already in that leadership position so although there was an administrator of nasa who as i say in the book we weren't always aligned perfectly i felt it was my responsibility because i had gained and i say the planets were aligned to get me that position um to do the hard thing and I know a lot of people get there and think, oh, man, this is so fun. I'm going to travel, uh, you know, because you can do pretty much anything you want in those jobs. And a lot of people just, just choose, you know, to go along, to get along. And I would say 
do make make sure you bend your pick on things that matter. People mm-hmm. don't want to fight with you at every turn. There are so many things that um, are going on at NASA that are done well. And I think being able to um, develop teams, show how things can be better in ways that don't necessarily cast blame are more positive. And that would be my advice. Fully recognizing I could have taken that advice better um, throughout my career. One of the things, it's, so you just used the word team. And I think that's huge, uh, you know, to to the listener from California that is is in state government. Uh, I would say I would back up what you're saying and say, form a team. Don't don't make your don't put yourself in a position to where it's easy for them to to cancel you. You know, you know, if, if there's a team now, there's a, there's a, there's. A little more difficulty to go in and say this whole team that we had looking into this all believes that we should do this and we're going to fire or transfer all of them that's probably not going to happen so uh, so i like the fact that you brought up the term team oh my goodness it's all about people i you know you said these rockets don't build themselves i mean it's just developing leadership is also about really getting the best people on the team, giving them the resources so that they can be successful, aligning, you know, people with a position so that they do um, see how they can bring their own value. No one person can know everything. Um, And I was criticized because I wasn't an engineer. Most people in the role have been, but you don't do engineering in that role. And if I was an engineer, I wasn't an astrophysicist or an earth scientist or a heliophysicist. There's just too much. And so you just have to select the very best people and give them the tools to be successful. I love it. So the book is Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA and Launch a New Space Age. Um, Can I assume that it can be purchased wherever books are sold? Wherever books are sold online and in stores. I narrated the audio book and um, you can find all this on my website, which is lauriegarver.com. I love it. Uh, Oh, so... Is it on Audible as well then? Yes, it's on Audible. One credit. <laughs> I love it. I recommend listening at 1.2. <laughs> it takes it from 11 hours to 9. And, and and you know, it's my own voice. So of course, I can't stand up. But I think uh, I speak too slow at 1.0. No, I, I love that you do that. And and I when I'm at the gym, I will... I'll look at how much time I have and I'll look at how long that particular podcast is or that book and go, okay, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like 1.2, 1.5. And, and uh, it, at, at some point in time, it does start to sound a little bit like Alvin and the chipmunks, but you can still get the information. Indeed. So uh, we've only got about a minute. Um, what's next for you? Well, I am continuing to do interviews like this and publicize the book. I continue to volunteer for both Earthrise and the Brooke Owens Fellowship, both nonprofit projects that um, I co-founded in order to um, advance this long-term agenda of leaving the world better than I found it. Um, I am also on a couple of corporate boards doing things to help advance um, the ability of our vantage of space to help all of us here on Earth. All right. And now, so you, you shared your website. Can you share that one again? Lori Garver, L-O-R-I-G-A-R-V-E-R.com. Com. I'm also active on Twitter and okay. Facebook, which is Lori underscore Garver. Perfect. I love it. Lori, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I would love to to stay in touch and I was just, I just got a notice that my camera just went out for some reason. You're out. Yep. But well, that's okay. They don't, need to look at, they don't need to look at me anymore anyway. <laughs> so, um, but for every, so again, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I would love to stay in touch and to, uh, especially if you're working on another book, uh, let's, uh, let's stay in touch and see if we can have you back. 
Happy to do it. Thanks for having me, Alan. All right. Thank you. And for everybody out there, be with us next week when we're joined by Rachel Katz and Helen Hayden. Uh, they are the authors of The Emotionally Intelligent Child. And please visit our archives of past interviews at answers.network, or you can subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Rumble, Spreaker, and so many more. And if you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people, and I want you to know that it is greatly appreciated. Uh, and the next time that you're on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page and check out some of our latest posts. And if you like them, please like us and spread the word. For everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on LA Talk Radio.